1998 as an entertainer in the Melbourne disco scene. With over 10 and with over 10 continental trips in that one year, the world truly was my oyster. Especially after my success in the audition meant I was going to China as a pop star. <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks later, I turned 23 and was hit by a car when crossing the turn highway. Marking the end of that life and the beginning of a whole new one, here I am now in front of you, finally with no comparison in time. Anniversaries are to be celebrated, so being here now to speak at the National Brain Injury Australia Conference is especially meaningful. The topic of this talk is what works. In that case, I could speak for days, sharing all I have found after leaving my recovery with constant attention from when I first left hospital. Natural curiosity has given exploration of anything I could find to get better. But, with only a short while, I'll speak about some of the main approaches I've used. A short statement here. I'm going to talk about how I have dealt with this the hardest of work. I don't want anyone here to feel that they are not doing enough. Brain injury surely isn't recognized as, as what it is in reality. A complete reboot of who you thought you were. I want to say, I see you, and well done, young people. So the first approach I'm going to speak about is self-belief. And this photograph was taken in Cambodia on New Year's Eve 2010 after I had fought a phase 4 Hodgkin's lymphoma all throughout 2009. I do still think I go to Cambodia after New Year's Eve. Anyway, so, self-belief, believe in your ability to get through. My experience shows doctors announcing you will never work again can have two possible outcomes. The diagnosis to be accepted and help provided in order for your life to be lived. Or, you decide to create your own rules and work down hard to, to achieve your own direction. This goes by my direction. <laughs> Dedicated attention to myself will continue for the rest of my days, and due to my inherent character, I am actually grateful for this. And I now express appreciation for what the accident has given me. I've had some wild <laughs> Long dark nights of the soul, however, excuse me, guys. Long dark nights of the soul leave lots of time for lying awake. Tired of what I saw as, as over reliance on pharmaceuticals, I no longer wanted to depend on them for my sleep, so I began to hone breathwork techniques. This technology can be traced back to humankind's very beginnings, and they helped on multiple, multiple levels. Children test and define boundaries all the time. With brain injury and what validly can be seen as a second childhood, these same boundaries are approached, but with a lot of consciousness. There was a period in the first decade where I practiced my memory each night. Coming back to those acting and interacting, in my mind, I could see where I could do better next time. During that same time, I felt the presence of a super Eva watching me and I experienced her approval. Existing away from this reality, but she, she is still close enough to affect it. Almost like a mothering presence, her presence, my presence, has always been there to help. Yet yeah, I needed to learn to listen to her. Self belief can't be described. You can't take it like a truth. Everlasting results come with the cost of the process. Though. The next approach I'm going to speak about is curiosity. And this is the acupuncture needles to make them better. Curiosity, remain open to new things and actively look for them. In my world, invitations are there to be pushed, to be overcome. This might be by walking everywhere, even with a link so bad that oncoming people leap out of the way. <laughs> the only way my walking was going to improve is through practice, endless practice, dance training. Or by standing on one leg whilst waiting for the little man to turn green, I gradually improved my balance. Or 
by signing up for an intense 18 month course investigating human nature even before five years have passed since you rebellion me. As well as giving you the chance to practice my handwriting and concentration, taking this course also assists with more complex functioning like consideration and academic investigation. That same year, I took a solitary trip to Japan and Greece in order to close the book on my heart. The time had come to stop endlessly slipping through my favorite avenues and to prove to myself that life over there had moved on, where now it's time for me to forget. By seeing obstacles as opportunities, my recovery, oh, my recovery flew against the mainstream that narrative. Speaking my perspective shows that reality is mine to shape. In choosing where I want to go and by working at it, my future has eventuated. Quite simply, I said yes. Hardly anything landed in my path has been a burden, although it took until 2020 before I realized I might have said yes to too much. Hey, would have been no problem. Another vital aspect to my recovery has been to explore therapy. Presently, presently, over 30 modalities tested over my past 23 years are being, are being documented. If you want a copy when, it, when I finish, please ask me. Going to show that by maintaining a curious outlook, effective ways to assist recovery to work as to those offered in standard therapy can be found. Embodying what I have found has shown such value. In refusing to accept others' perceived limitations, therapy, such as Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, yoga, meditation, and body work, have helped some of the largest shifts I've experienced in mind, body, and soul. My approach, combining naturopathy with chemotherapy and stage four cancer, a decade after the injury, eventuated in my avoiding radiotherapy completely, verified by my oncologist. The next approach I'm going to speak about is determination. And this is me learning to rollerblade again in 2021. Lockdown, but I was able to see my physio, and I used to be a pretty damn good rollerblader before my injury. And I'm, I'm trying to learn it again. So the next thing I'm talking about is determination. Never give up. After speaking of the power of creating your own reality, I want to emphasize sticking at it. Even if this is not part of your personality before, after brain injury, the chance is given to develop ourselves all over again. And we can make this own our own. After all, change happens bit by bit. Sometimes decades can pass before even a small difference can be seen. And I know I'm talking to others in the room here who can, who can agree with me, the sense of achievement of that happy is just like nothing else. Keep exercising, keep exploring, keep growing, keep the faith of a new you. This is a long haul. From brain injury to life. Taking steps towards your goals and by looking for the new, opportunities will arise. By saying yes, you will expand infinitely. This injury has the potential to be the greatest gift of your life. Oh. <laughs> What is needed to see this is a shift of perspective. And we are all capable of this. With dedication, looking your thoughts to see what is actually being offered will become public. Your best friend is looking back at you in the mirror. They're the, they're the ones who have proven you should be seeking, you should be seeking. It is up to you to be the guiding force behind the mirror. As a source of freedom and growth, stepping into your own power, feeds the soul and stokes motivation. Determination is required in this situation. The only person who can make change happen is you. The next approach I'm going to speak about is passion. And this is me leading a biopsy course um, just before COVID. Remember when things take <laughs> So, passion for life and for everything you do. This time spent healing is a blessing. It really helps to see it that way. The future is yours to mold, so identify what makes you tick and make moves towards it. Being directed by your heart will uncover the most surprising possibilities. A life you are happy to be in. 
learn new ways to express yourself, study what interests you, volunteer in areas that line up to your passion, connect with your community, see what it offers, and build your future with what you have now. Doing any or all of these things will open a new world and progression will become obvious. By saying yes, doors will open, doors will open to you. Which destination do you want to learn? Yes. Which perspective do you wish to hear it from? In a life driven by passion, one of the many benefits to ADR can occur. Too often say, this is what I want to do, so I'll do it, and be sure that they can. True dedication to the creation of your new self, the chance to fully love and accept the, the, the results eventuate. Imagine, due to this injury, you can become the friend you always wanted to have. And this is me in rehearsal for a show that played at the Darabin Festival in Northcote Town Hall at the end of 2019 with a million crowds. And that lady up there said that that would be a bad day. You know, that she was still thinking and things like that. And she was talking to her. Do you see this? Oh, so. Creativity. Practice thinking and living creatively. Throughout my entire journey, I have not lost my creative spirit. Indeed, it has carried me where otherwise I might fail. Currently, I'm producing a piece of theatre. To my knowledge, the only professional production centred on our experience of ADR. The directors, the renowned directors, come from both the UK and Adelaide. Four Victorian performers will appear on stage with contributions of two regional New South Wales artists. Everyone involved has fun with me. Pieces of me is coming soon. When I could stand on just keep checking if you can still see the presentation. The art. Just make sure if you can still see the presentation. Yeah, sure. The biggest gift of my recovery landed while sneaking to the gym in 2007. As I passed the Adelaide Cricket Ground, the blossoms decorating the Christmas trees were in full bloom and bursting nests tweeted their contents. The air shone with the purple. In that very moment, a simple yet profound shift in my view of the world was realized, changing everything. Passing from grief into gratitude sent me on onto a completely new path. After this, my interest was grounded here in what I knew was my truth. And my progression, that's it. Okay. I have a PhD in getting better. Recognizing this has enabled development of an office to my peers with brain injury. Everyone present on a panel with brain injury. Taking what I've learned building a new me, I offer them to group with my peers. Sparking a discussion unlike any other, we share strategies used in the lived experience of brain injury. Everyone present benefits, including myself. As Australia's first and only peer developed and led training, by accident, is a remarkable place. Everyone there is recognized as an authority of their own experience. Truly, no one knows brain injury better than those who experience it. Ultimately, what I really needed whilst recovering was to hear from people, to hear from people who have survived and thrived through their experience. The brain injury is specifically all the limitations we are told in our new life in order to release, to realize it is actually in our power to succeed. By sharing space with others and by sharing space with peers, we learn from those who know, who have lived through the lessons that they share. No limitations exist, only recognition and appreciation. I've been overjoyed to hear many of the participants reaching the tipping point of gratitude in their own recovery, and this affirms what a vital step it is. Over the past two and a half years, Melbourne Self Advocacy Group Brain Injury Matters has sponsored by accident. Ten theories held during the age of COVID gave the tip to shift from formally purely face-to-face sessions for online delivery. This now makes it possible to be, taken, to be easily taken nationwide. Please come and speak with me 
about running a biopsy for your community. I'm going to play a short video now, showing by accident. It's available, it's available on my website, byaccident.com.au. I have time here that you can, I can get to you, and I'd, I'd, I'd be overjoyed to speak with you. Thank you for your attention. I'd just like to start by apologising to you all. I'm reading my speech word for word, so it might be a bit robotic. There's got to be some benefit to having a brain injury, but apart from qualifying for a disabled parking permit, after all. My name is Claire Cooper. I'm going to be talking to you today about my experience of brain injury and a bit about my life before and after. Specifically, I'm going to talk about what it's like to wake up with one day with a brain injury and the process of getting to know myself again and the possibilities of recovery. What I'd like to, you to take away from this today is that the standardised model of a brain injured patient and their rehabilitation isn't always helpful. No two brain injuries are the same and neither is their path to recovery. Before being hit by a car in 2013, I was a successful classical pianist with more than a quarter of a century in the music business. I mentored, coached and accompanied other musicians for their auditions, exams, concerts and recordings. 
As a self-employed musician, I needed to be very organized and disciplined. I had no idea how useful that would be to me now. I was also a consummate multitasker. To give you an idea, in rehearsal, a complete stranger would come in, give me music I had possibly never seen before and start playing. I would have to read their line too, speed up and slow down as they did, balance the volume of my playing to match theirs and think of something to say which would improve their playing. Often having to decide what kind of person they were and how I'd break it to them that they weren't as good as they'd been led to believe. Then out of the blue, I was hit by a car. I was on the upfield bike path in Parkville, heading to work at Melbourne Uni. The driver was on his mobile phone, talking to a mate. The lights were red at the crossing, which he claimed he didn't see. He rang his mate back immediately after the crash to ask for advice. Fortunately for me, there were people on the bike path and traffic stopped in both directions. Someone rang an ambulance and the police. There were many witnesses. The ambulance took me to Royal Melbourne Hospital in the next suburb. I was very lucky to be treated so quickly. The hospital rang my partner at work. He arrived to find me in a coma and intubated in intensive care. The initial assessment showed bleeding on the brain, a shattered pelvis, a completely torn tendon in my shoulder, six broken ribs and a collapsed lung. Much later I found out I had a brain injury. I was in a coma for three weeks. I have no recollection of my time at Royal Melbourne, but I was in intensive care for about a month. I had a hole cut in my throat for breathing, a blood transfusion, a pipe in my stomach for feeding, and I swelled up like a balloon from all the medication I was given. When I could be moved, I was transferred to Epworth, Epworth Hospital. I was in hospital for four months or up. The difference in the way people treated me was so stark and immediate. immediate. I was shocked. It was yet another thing to which I had to adjust. One minute I was a capable, independent and accomplished classical musician with plans for the future. People assumed I was intelligent, productive and organised. The next minute I was being treated like an idiot. I'll never forget the first time I used the phone again. The person there on the other end heard my slurred speech and immediately started speaking slower and louder. You could almost hear the gear shift. It still happens occasionally. Adjusting to this and the complete inability to multitask has been challenging to say the least. I couldn't listen to the radio when I first started to drive again as it was too distracting. I had also I had to teach, reteach myself to breathe under water when I swim. <laughs> Initially, I thought buying a snorkel would be a great way around this, but then breathed in for, through my nose. They also say you never forget how to ride a bike. Let me assure you, you do. A couple of years after the smash, I reluctantly tried Botox for the spasticity which I have on most of my right side and my tongue. My physio was very encouraging, so I started with my calf and then my hamstring. Despite it making me fall over even more than I was already doing, it didn't seem to do me any harm, so I eventually decided to try some in my arm. Big mistake. Almost immediately, I could no longer do the things I had worked so hard to relearn. Doing up buttons, jeans, flossing my teeth, rolling up sleeves, I couldn't do, again. It was probably the most depressing thing I've ever done. It did wear off after a few months, but not before my desperate questions to the doctor asking whether I would at least get back what I'd lost. She told me it should return, not terribly encouraging. This is an example of the one size fits all attitude which I encountered again and again. Botox is probably good for some people, but I don't believe it's made any difference at all to my spasticity. I also had double vision for which I was told I would need surgery, but I chose to do vision therapy instead, and it's worked. I also do myotherapy and Feldenkrais. <clears throat> it's taken years to work out what's effective for me. I wonder what would have happened if I hadn't been as willing to argue and question the standard treatment. <laughs> the staff at the hospital thought I was lovely until I started to talk. A few years ago, I went interstate for a family emergency. I was home 
for, away from home eight days and only managed a couple of short walks in that time. Normally I swim twice a week, do personal training once a week and try and go for a walk or use a bike trainer, trainer every other day. So it's some form of exercise at least five days a week. What I hadn't realised is how absolutely vital it is to my physical well-being. The spasticity results in short muscles if you don't continually stretch them. I was shocked to find myself in pain and walking like an old person after only a week of my disturbed routine. <coughs> I now think if I didn't continue with exercise, I'd be on painkillers and probably end up back in a wheelchair. My musical training has been beneficial in so many ways. But I think one of the most important things was the ability to recognise improvement. It's the only thing that keeps you practising. If you didn't notice tiny incremental improvement every day, you just wouldn't bother doing it. Also, repetition is crucial and most people have no idea just how much repetition is needed in music practice. It's exactly the same with retraining the brain. Both piano practice and rehab have to be very conscious, which is why controlling the speed at which they are is crucial. If either is done too fast, you run the risk of practicing in bad habits. Once you learn something rightly or wrongly, it's very hard to unlearn. You tell your brain that this is the way it's done and it's extremely difficult to change. In doing any practice, you need to go slow enough to be aware of what you're doing, both physically and mentally consciously. Relaxing a muscle is something you have to learn. I never knew that until I couldn't do it. Norman Doidge, the guru of neuroplasticity, says <clears throat> differentiation, making the smallest possible sensory distinctions between movements, builds brain maps. I call it having access to particular muscles, being able to make my brain go there. I can access most muscles now and I can thank myotherapy for that and I couldn't do Feldenkrais without being able to differentiate. <clears throat> this is why Feldenkrais is not for everyone, but it worked really well for me. Even while I was in hospital, I kept wondering why there seemed to be a bit of an obsession about measurable outcomes. I remember I was often made to do the six minute walk. You had to walk as fast as you could for six minutes. They measured how far you went. <laughs> that way they could tell whether you had improved by going further the next time you were tested. That meant you were walking faster. <clears throat> I now realise that this is possibly a way that normal people, non-musicians, non can recognise their improvement. Thanks to music, I already had that ability in spades, but most people don't, it seems. It's so important to have hope. And this may be a way, way of pro providing that to patients. I have no reason to think that the improvement will ever stop as long as I keep working at it. The preoccupation with measurement, I think, is also linked to funding. How much rehab would you need? How much is it going to cost? My first experience with Centrelink demonstrates this. I was asked, had I plateaued? I had no idea what they were talking about. It was explained to me that plateauing meant that someone with an impairment has got as far as they can in their recovery. For me, this kind of thinking is complete rubbish and clearly demonstrates that government, agent, government agencies aren't interested in people. People need to know that there is no point at which if they haven't recovered, improvement is suddenly gonna stop. As an aside, I'm hoping there are people in the audience who can influence how government agencies like Centrelink deal with people like me. I'm an intelligent, well-educated, articulate woman, and if I had so much trouble, I wonder what the experience is like for people less capable than me. My life is difficult enough living with a brain injury, but every dealing I've had with Centrelink has been stressful and humiliating. My application for a disability support pension was initially refused because I was unable to demonstrate to, Centrelink, to a Centrelink assessor that I was sufficiently disabled. It took a freedom of information request to access my file to work out that key medical information was missing and then two further appeals even to have my application accepted. Having been at the receiving end of treatment for brain injury and being someone who possibly doesn't fit the standard model, 
I'm left wondering how the process could be more nuanced and patient focused. I also believe there needs to be a much stronger focus on the possibility of long-term recovery. I'm still finding improvement after almost nine years after my injury and see no reason for that not to continue. It won't be spontaneous, but I believe that the element of self-determination gives patients a much needed sense of control and hope. Thank you. Therapist and stresses all moving in their own direction. No one asked me what I wanted, 
it wasn't my direction. My mom and my team, I swear to be the country. They give me honest feedback. I know they have my back, and I give the information to make my own decisions. Because the important is coming independent. So post accident, I've had to reestablish myself, plan a new career, and be smarter than I ever had to be, even though I have responsibility. The same happens play out. I'm great. I'm a great advert for reinventing yourself to try and build a new career pathway. Can anyone do a free test site? Anyone know what a free test site is? <laughs> That's a really good picture. My desire to improve and prove to myself and others that I was okay with my motivation. I just didn't want to be okay though. I wanted to win. I'm not sure why I wanted to turn my relapse into great, but I was so bloody impatient. And along the way, I had some amazing success. Medals at state, national, and international athletic events. It was awesome. It was my desire to continue to push my rehab and my training. My training was, my training was, and rehab were alive. I had direction and was focused. I saw my rehabilitation had been success, but also realized it was ongoing and I must be feeling good at it, otherwise I regret. This is not to say because I'm on track, my support stuff. But every day, it's tried to force it to be ongoing part of my life. I would go to the place to do his training on my his support how he does his training with him. I was completely really bored of limitations to drive his approaches in delivering a holistic program that aligns with goals and takes more protection space. And the alignment of vocational choices with training is personalized as we have by providing a sense of service and consistent with certain skills. Physical exercise and regular planning seriously improves brain health. Brain injuries affect different parts of cognition depending on the time of the person or the location of the injury. And the constant repetition of physical exercise and routine has helped balance general physical rehabilitation and the overall cognitive health. I am based on repetition, structure, and when I stay on top of my fatigue. I still require my daily memory and have time to act to reach out. I am constantly aware that my fatigue protects my function. My function to live, communicate, maintain positive relationships, and end to pain. I have to tolerate my well being, be effective, and live the life I want to live. At times, setting the boundaries for my well being clashes with what other people have in mind for me. But I know what I can do and what I need to do rest, recharge, and go in. I make no apologies for that. I say every day in this cognitive biology psychologist that the interplay of cognitive and physical training is dependent. We continue to search that elusive balance. And I think that it will always be elusive because life is not static. The dynamics of living, developing relationships, work, and dealing with fatigue is never straightforward. And like everyone, we need the signs and we accept them. Einstein always says nothing happens until something is. Why should we move all the time? My training is doing four runs. Three strength sessions and two full sessions a week. I'm constantly doing something to stay on top of my rehabilitation and to push to be the best as I can as a middle distance athlete. We measure my progress in various tests over a 12 week period to match the variation. And uh, as, as Claire mentioned, tests and outcomes and, and measuring performance in relation to funding is a really tricky situation. But as Alex did mention, we factored in testing and, and we did it every four weeks for three months. I think this is maybe before the first time that the uh, Jet Group uh, conference was scheduled. And you know, without getting too specific and going into all those details, we saw overall improvement, but we also saw fluctuations, fluctuations in decreases in pain. And there are reasons for those fluctuations. So for Alex to have improvement, she needs to continually practice the test to embed them with established rules and pain. And she cannot be fatigued. But we've discovered that black and white standardized tests and the data have not improved in any dramatic form. But we have seen improvements in function and care performance. So Alex's neuroscience reports that with support, Alex's situation will improve in real life. And she's utilizing more of her executive function skills, controlling behaviors, executive policy, sort of. <laughs> um, 
she displays increased emotional control and has improved in her daily life. And this has improved her quality of life, which is what we really want to make up. Continue to have this same sort of guy, coordination, dedication, strength, and mission descriptions. These issues are lifelong and are always the journey of progression through this sort of thing down. So you can agree. I'm happy to say, if you like, let's just say, as a joke, I said, mate, I've already got six dark problems. Why would I want that? <laughs> okay. That's not even a space point. I just want to say what it takes to balance. <laughs> These issues are lifelong and are always appearing in three ways to improve and slip them down. I have been able to apply my understanding of my own situation to be covered from staying on vacation to my training and we're next to learn through a hands on approach, planning, problem solving, reflective practice, and some feedback. <laughs> many of the kids may, may, may be aware of how targeted physical activity programs contain very similar therapeutical cognitive training strategies that are officially offered in their neuropsychological equipment. It has been a bloody wild ride. I have met some great people, some dodgy ones, and made strong friendships. I now have what I refer to as the team, Alex, the dream team. Can I have the dream team be upstanding? Dr. Dave Buckell. and Mark Reed. It's when I first defined my perfect team that the other side of my life came together. I started my own business, started early learning childhood fitness classes, became a strength and distance coach for a rugby team, and then to the fitness learning opportunities. Merging cognition and the physical domain has helped bridge the gap between therapy and life function. And through Alice's new vocational choices, she's continually practicing her own brain training through coaching and mind treatment programs. There was a reason for my survival. It could have been because I was the age of 27 and most of the legends like to have been with the Pete Ledger, Brittany Murphy, but apparently I survived. I used to be a case manager working for people in need of support. I think, and it evolved to evolve. And so my new role is to consult, educate, and help others to figure outside the box. It's about putting together my somewhat executive function skills, which were heavily impacted as a result of my actions. Challenges became opportunities, and opportunities have provided me with a great awareness of what things that others have done to similarly help. I feel their pain. I have a great appreciation of life, and I value. Dignity, self respect, and family so much more. I had to rebuild my body, my brain, my bed, and my outlook. I had to reset. One more quote. <laughs> okay, who remembers Brenda? The other one's the pink and the one you're the red. For some reason, this has always resonated with me. So I think it's a gift from Brenda to give it. You always had the power, my dear, to just have a look for yourself. Thank you. Thank you.